So the most beautiful thing about the birth of Christ, y'all, is that it signified the reality of an intentional and strategic and really a super thought out plan, right? Not just for me or just for you, but for all of humanity, right? And this plan, as thoughtful and considerate and mindful as it is, it would include our Savior's death. That's strange, right? That God showed his love for us by rolling out a plan that would necessitate the death of his own son. Well, it's not that strange when you understand what his death means for all of humanity and what power he has over death itself. Thank the Lord. It's beautiful. It's incredible. And as Kirk said, it's the reason why we sing, right? It's the reason why we sing. So we've been in a series here at Westside entitled, This Christmas and Every Christmas is what? It's all about Christ, y'all, because it is. So in this series, it's been my aim, as well as Tracy Ross, who preached last week. Uh, she shared with us, the aim of for us is to present to you an argument that there is no celebration of Christ, right? Which Christmas literally means Christ Mass, a party for Christ, right? There is no celebration of Christ without Christ. Right now, I know that sounds obvious, but, but the day recognized to celebrate Christ's birth is the only one that's so often done so without consideration for the person whose name it bears. Am I wrong about that? No, no, I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong. Think about it. On Christmas, we have so many traditions, so many things that we're focusing on. Obviously, we got gift giving and receiving. Some people do family uh, cookies. You know, y'all do the, the, the family parties for the cookies and stuff? Y'all doing any of those? Anybody? It's an Italian thing. I know a lot of Italian families make a bunch of cookies, and they kind of lay them out. Uh, it's a beautiful blessing to have the cookies and the friends who do the cookies. Um, we got ugly sweater parties. Anybody went to any ugly sweater parties so far this year? No. Okay, that's a thing. That's a new thing. It's, a, it's always a good reason to buy an ugly sweater. Uh, it's all kinds of parties. And far too often, everyone um, is remembered in the planning of these festivities except for Christ. We're doing all this stuff. It's good. Now, it's not wrong for us to have traditions. Some people will argue so, but that's not my position, nor do I believe that that is the contextually biblical position. I say have fun. I say live your life, enjoy yourself, right? But I say honor God in all of your fun having and your life living. That's the call. Why? Because he's worthy and he's worth it, right? So just honor him. Do your thing, but do your thing honoring God. And so this morning, I'm going to conclude our Christmas series on this beautiful Christmas Eve, y'all. With a message entitled, It's a Wrap. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, It's a Wrap. Because it is, y'all. Listen, I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine, and he was making a point to me that people who grew up in urban environments like Trenton, Philly, Camden, uh, St. Louis, Chicago, Compton, wherever, Southeast DC, because that's where he's from, uh, plenty of other places. People who are, grew up in those areas are intrinsically bilingual. That was the point that he was making to us, right? He made the point that what we all call Ebonics or slang is actually becoming a more professionally recognized language known as AAVE. Have any of y'all ever heard of that before? It's called African American Vernacular English. It is a real thing. Look it up. That's what I said. Job application is about to be lit. Yes. You speak in another language? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Ha <laughs> ha! be lit. How what language you speak? Hey man, A B E man. You know, I got I speak Av, you know what I mean? Or Ave, you know, whatever, however you want to do it. So he's actually making this argument. It's a very smart brother. So I you know, I trust his word. So we are bilingual. If you grew up in an urban context, we speak A A V E. So when I say it's a rap, some of us we understand. That this phrase denotes something that's drawing to an end, something that's coming to a close, right? Like, uh, you know, if we playing basketball, Chuck guard me, I put, I put the one up, I say it's a rat, you know what I mean? Oh, that, that ain't how it happened. That ain't how it happened. <laughs> that's not usually how it happens, y'all. You know what I'm saying? But I got the mic right now. <laughs> so, yeah. But what I'm saying is that Christ Jesus in his life, burial, and his death, his resurrection, 
has ended or brought to a close for us the hostility, the beef, the on-site, the say less. You know what I mean? Chairs flying, Jerry Springer, come on stage, that thing that, that we had with him. The Bible says that we were at enmity with God, that we had a beef that just didn't know an end. When we saw it was Tom and Jerry, right? It was go time. All the time was go time. It was Krishan rocking anybody, right? Like, everyone go. It's just, this is how I go. You know, it's, just, it's always go time. With Christ Jesus, we're able to say it's a wrap because that is over. The war that existed between us and God is over, is fulfilled, is satisfied in the person of Christ Jesus. That's right, Brenda, you clap. That's a good reason to clap. It is. It is. If you like me and you realize how bad you were, how bad you are, let me fix that, scratch that out. If you realize how bad you are, you're grateful that what you've done is no longer going to be held against you because of what Jesus has done. So we can say, y'all, it's a wrap. And we can mean that. For real, we can mean it. So this beef that started at the moment that sin entered the world and now permeates through the very fabric of our DNA, the fact of the matter is that God is perfect and he requires perfection from each of us in order to be in a relationship with him. So many of us say that we're in a relationship. Everybody is in a relationship. You've ever gone to a funeral and that person says that this person is not with the Lord right now? I've never heard it in my life. I've, it doesn't matter how they live. It doesn't matter what they believed in. Everybody is always talked of as being with the Lord. But the reality, y'all, is not true. It's not true. Not everybody is with Jesus. I can guarantee you that. That requires and necessitates a relationship prior to our eternal uh, fellowship with him forever. And the relationship for us, thank God, it ain't about how good we are. It's about how good Jesus is and about what Jesus did for us. So we can be able to say the penalty that we was going to get, it's a wrap for that. <laughs> right? We are in Christ Jesus. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. Some people think that's unfair. Okay, yo. But they also can agree, these same people who say that it's unfair that God will require some of us would would go on social media and agree that uh, a list of restaurants for men to take a woman out on a first date is acceptable practice. So there's a whole list of do nots on uh, the first date. That was posted recently. I mean, it got Cheesecake Factory on there. I said, how you put Cheesecake? Cheesecake Factory is a good spot. I thought it was a good, I thought it was a good spot. You know, now you can't even take nobody to Cheesecake Factory. I got to take you to Ruth Chris on the first day. I'm sorry. I'm so, I got a budget. You know what I'm saying? I got a budget. You know, y'all need to be able to respect a man with a plan, all right? You know, respect a man with a plan. So what I'm saying is that if God can, if, uh, if, if we can accept the fact that, that women have standards that they're going to hold people to, we got to be able to accept the fact that God has standards that he's going to hold us to. We, we like to try to, you know what I mean, we make the one for the, for the two. It's never one for one, right? But God does have a standard. He has a plan. And again, I say it, maybe a bunch. Thank God that the standard is not our perfection. There's some faiths that believe that at the end of eternity, in order for us to go into paradise, then our good have to outweigh our bad. I can tell y'all straight up, if that's, if that's the requirement for me, I'm not getting in. I can tell y'all that now. It's not, it's not happening. Because scripture says even my good deeds are but filthy rags before God. They're, they're tainted with sin. The good things I do, there's something in me that's like, you know, I, I want some praise for it. I want some adoration for the things that I do. It's not fully pure as much as I want it to be. It's not. That's just the reality of my human condition. And so this, this thing is good for us because... God so loved the world that he gave his one-of-a-kind son so that everyone who believes in him would never, like Chris Rock, never, never, they would never perish. They would never, ever meet their demise. But they would experience an eternal life that starts now and continues throughout all of eternity. That's an amazing thought, y'all. Because of Christ Jesus, it's a wrap. And so I like to take that idea, and I like to walk through just a few ways that Christ was wrapped so that we can boldly exclaim, it's a wrap. It's a wrap, y'all. Somebody say, it's a wrap. Because it is. It is. It is. So uh, this season is one that's really special, as we already talked about a few times already, because today is Christmas Eve. There's some people out here 
who are very serious about the way that they wrap gifts. Are there any of those people in the building? Crystal's hand went up quick. Vic's hand went up quick. Sam, hand went up. All right. All right. My man, Sam, I've got a couple things to drop off to you today. Today. As a matter of fact, I could just spread the wealth. I don't want to overload one person. So some people, they're really good at wrapping gifts. They take it very serious. And, you know, they might do things like, I have a slide. They, they might do things like, like this. They might post up some, some of their gifts in a, Ray, I got the slide. Okay, sorry. Ray's caught up, y'all. Sorry, sorry. No, not, there we go. That one, that one, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some people, y'all see that? Do y'all see that? That's just craziness. Why y'all out there cutting branches off to put it on your Christmas gift? I don't want an acorn. I don't need that pine cone. What is that? Is that cinnamon sticks at the bottom? That's cinnamon sticks, right? <laughs> Some people get real serious. They want you to get all of your senses involved in the gift-giving process. Now, i am be honest. I wish that was me. I wish that was me. But the reality is just not, y'all. I try to be neat, though. I do try to be neat. I round the corners. I tuck it in. I, I tape everything. It, it don't come out quite like that. The rest of us, <laughs> you know, our, our stuff kind of look a little bit like this, this next slide here. Huh? Perfect. Anybody here relate to that one? Huh? Is it wrapped, though? Is it wrapped? <laughs> That's the question. It is wrapped. What you want? What you want? Y'all know the people that wrap the basketball? <laughs> wrap the basketball, the newspaper, just bounce that junk, just throw it around. Like, it's wrapped up. That's the rest of us. That's how we live in. But the reality for all of us, no matter if you are a good gift wrapper, gift wrapper or not, uh, we serve a God who is the best, right? And the greatest gift that he offered us, he wrapped for us, right? As I said earlier, Christ Jesus was wrapped for us. And I want to walk through a few ways that he was. And the first one is this. Christ was wrapped in flesh. Christ was wrapped in flesh. The Father is so skillful, y'all. It's like the cinnamon stick thing. He's just so meticulous and it's so intricate that he will wrap himself, his son, I'm sorry, he will wrap his son in flesh for us. Why? 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 There's this thing called the doctrine of incarnation. You guys are familiar with incarnation? We're going to talk about a couple things, okay? Talk about a couple things today. Maybe you want to take some notes. Let's look at John 1.14. John 1.14. It says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory. The glory as the one and only son. The one and only son. The one and only son from the Father. Full of grace and truth. So this doctrine of incarnation is very simple. It's just that Jesus became flesh, right? He existed always as God, right? John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, right? He always existed. There's never a time where Jesus was created. He was not. He is God, fully God. But for some reason, God sent his Son to become flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son of God. Okay, so the, the God of all creation who was there at the beginning when the Lord said, let there be, and there was, became flesh, put on flesh, humbled Himself to this stuff. This the reason, y'all. This the reason right here why we do all the things we do. The, Paul said, the good I want to do, I can't do. The bad things I don't want to do, that's the stuff that I do. Oh, who can deliver me from this body of death? Oh, wretched man that I am, right? That's what he said. Who can deliver me from this thing? Why would Jesus put that on? If I seen it, like, I'm sorry, Najee, I'm never putting that on. I'm never doing that. I'm just never doing that. As a diehard Eagles fan, that's just never, you know, that's like putting on a body of death. <laughs> Oh, wretched man. <laughs> oh, wretched man that I am. You know what I'm saying? Like, Christ, why would he do that? Why would he do it? Amen. There was a necessity for his incarnation. Let's take a look at this Hebrews chapter 2 verse real quick. It says, but we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time so that by God's grace, he might taste death for everyone. We see that Jesus, right? That same one who was made a little lower so that he might taste death for everyone. This is the reason here. We're talking about the reason. We see that Jesus crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the pioneer, the captain of their salvation, perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one father. That's Jesus and us, right? 
That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Again, I will trust in him. Again, 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 I will trust in him. And again, here I am with the children God gave me. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, now since the children have flesh and blood in common, right? That's all of us. We're the children. We all have flesh and blood in common. All right? We look a little different. As I said yesterday, we smell a little different, right? We sound a little different, but we all have flesh and blood in common. That's something that we have together, right? Since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these. Jesus also shared in these so that through his death, he might destroy the one holding the power of death. That is who? The devil. And free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring, which is us, right? Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God. Why? To make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. All right. There was a necessity for this doctrine that I talked about, this word. What was the word y'all remember? Incarnation, this doctrine of incarnation, Christ Jesus put on flesh. I said, why would you do that? If you're an Eagles fan, why would you put on a cowboy jersey? Why would you just do that? There's no reason to do that. Well, there was a reason for Jesus to come from eternity where he was perfect, fully righteous. I'm sorry, Chuck. You all right? <laughs> all right? I lost Chuck. I lost Chuck. I lost Chuck. Come back. Come back. Where Jesus was fully righteous, holy, without sin, without spot, without blemish, to put on flesh. It's a reason why he did it. Right? This verse 17 says it, to make atonement. For the sins of the people. Right? We are people who are born in sin. So in order for us to have forgiveness of our sin, in order for there to be redemption for us, there had to be a sacrifice for us that matched us. That's who Jesus became. Jesus is not like us, but he became like us. He made himself low so that he could be for us exactly what we need. Why? Because in order for there to be redemption, there needed to be a payment. And no payment would have been sufficient other than human sacrifice. There had to be, they were sacrificing lambs, right? As I said before, listen, no more curry goat. No more curry goat. If you, it's just me, right? Just for me, all the curry goat is gone, right? Because all the lambs would have been sacrificed just for me. But Jesus came to be the precious lamb of God, the one who was able fully to take on the sins of the whole world. No leftovers, y'all. No leftovers. All of God's wrath was placed on him. He became flesh so that he can fully take on our sin, our punishment, and give us his righteousness. Transference. God and Jesus did for us what we needed to be done so that we could be with him forever. So that we could know what it's like to have God's love live in us and live through us. God saw us. He saw that we had issues. He saw that we were basically getting jumped. He says the devil was the one who was uh, holding the fear of death over us. and He basically saw us getting jumped and he didn't just walk by. He jumped right in. He was that bypass that said, oh, no, he just jumped right into the crowd. Help him out, help him out. Jesus did for us what we absolutely needed him to do, y'all, but we could have never done ourselves. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how, how great you can fight. You never would have been able to fight yourself out of this. You would have been demolished. So why is it important that Jesus was fully human? Because it was humanity that fully fumbled. It was us. It was us. It wasn't the angels. It wasn't lambs. It wasn't go. It wasn't. It was us. We messed up. So Jesus jumped in. Uh, Hebrews two fourteen says that through his death, Jesus would destroy the one holding the power. Right. And so that word for destroy in the Greek means to uh, deactivate or to counter an attempt for harm. So you can think about it the way that somebody would uh, defuse a bomb. Right. So you got. 
the bomb, and then who is it? The SEALs? Who, who comes in to defuse and deactivate the bombs? The bomb squad. Let's just call them the bomb squad. All right, so you come in, and you're looking at the wires, and do, 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 do. should I clip that one? Should I clip that one? <laughs> so wrong one, wrong one. Jesus doesn't miss, right? Jesus comes in, and he sees what's going on, and he does the work necessary to defuse the situation. Now, when I think about it, because I like boxing, this idea of this word is, uh, what is it, krigos or keregis in the Greek? But it's a word that, that, that does mean this, this idea of countering somebody's attempt. So I think about boxing, right? So, you know, one of the, one of the things that people like about boxing is the brutality. They just like the, the brunt force. That's not my thing. I, that's not what I most enjoy about boxing. I don't just enjoy seeing people get punched in the face. That's not, that's not my thing. What I enjoy about boxing is what they call the sweet science, right? It's this, it's this dance that happens. It's a, it's a skill that takes place for you to be able to see something that's coming before the person knows that you see what's coming and then be able to react to it, right? The point of boxing is not just to beat people up. It's to outscore them, right? That's why I think Floyd Mayweather is the best of all time. I'm not saying he's my favorite, but he's the best because he figured out how to do it. He figured out how to hit and not be hit. That's, that's the point of boxing, right? And so when I think about this thing, I think about this fact that um, Jesus... In essence, was the, the greatest counterpuncher of all time. Because the counterpunch is like one of the most lethal punches you can throw in boxing. That's understanding what your opponent is going to throw at you and then knowing when to roll off of it and when to respond. And so Jesus did just like that. When Satan was trying his best to beat up his children, to try to attack us, Jesus came in, took our place, and he countered Satan's attempt to destroy us, and he destroyed him. Jesus stood in the gap for us, and he gave Satan the kind of blow that was reverberated throughout all of humanity. Right? Jesus hit Satan so hard that the, the angels of heaven began to rejoice, and that we experienced a liberation and a freedom that started at that moment and then lasted forever. Talk about a punch. Talk about waking up in the morning. With, you know, imagine how Satan feels knowing that it doesn't matter what he does, he does right now. He cannot interrupt what God has done on our behalf against him. S Satan is defeated. Hallelujah. <laughs> right? There is no weapon that's formed against us that can prosper because Jesus stepped in. Jesus stepped in and he did what he did for us. It's a beautiful thing. The second thing that Christ was wrapped in, y'all, he was wrapped in the Father's wrath. He was wrapped in the Father's wrath. Isaiah 53.10 says this. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days. And by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. So there's this reality. Well, you know what? Let's look at Luke 22 first. I'll look at both of these verses. Father, if you're willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So we, we see this idea of the wrath of God in Isaiah 53. It said it was the Father's pleasure. It pleased the Father to crush Jesus. I talked about this a few times. Why would, why would the Father be pleased to see his son crushed? Right? Because there was a plan, y'all. There was a plan all along. Right? The plan was a big plan. This is why I say not everybody has a relationship with the Lord. It costs something for this plan to be accomplished. So it pleased the Father to crush his son because there was something coming in the end. There was something being worked out. Jesus himself, in the garden of Gethsemane, he's praying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Think about that. This is the Savior. He does not want to have to endure this if it's not absolutely necessary. But he says what at the end? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Why? Because there was a plan that was put into place that Jesus was so in line with, that he was so in love with, he was willing to endure something that was going to be extremely uncomfortable for him. Something that was going to be devastating for him. Yes, the physical reality was, was something. But y'all, it was really about the spiritual disconnect that was going to happen once Jesus took on our sin. Think about it. Jesus had never sinned. He never knew what it was like to wake up in the morning with regret. Right? He never knew what it was like to, to move in the next step and think, man, why did I do that? Jesus never experienced that. So when he took on our sin, he took on all of that. Think about it. Think about all at once, all of the sin that you've ever committed being thought, like thrusted upon you at one time. All of that guilt, all that shame, all that condemnation at one time. Jesus saying, God, if there's a way, like, let, let, that, let that cup pass. Like, I, I don't want to know what it's like to not be close to you, to feel like I failed you, to feel far away from you. I, I, I don't want to know what that's like. I, I love how it feels to know that I am yours and you are mine. I, I like the perfect fellowship and the, the blessed communion that we have with one another, that I can speak to you and you speak right back to me and I know that I'm yours and, and I know that we're there with each other. I, I, I like that feeling. I don't want to feel that other thing. 
So if there's a way, let it pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Your will be done. So this was a difficult demonstration of love. It was motivated by a true love, a full kind of love, y'all. A full love. I mean, the kind of love that, that people write songs about, you know, like songs that we sing. And you're like, hey, nobody, nobody's going to do that, you know. Like, nobody's actually going to do that. This is the kind of love that we saw in Jesus. I will cross the oceans for you. No, you're not. It's, not. it's impossible. But, but Jesus can do it. Jesus can do it. Right? There's a way that we can actually know that love for real in Christ Jesus. And we, and we do, y'all. We do. We do. So some people might be thinking, like, is this really a Christmas message? Like, we're talking about Jesus being wrapped in wrath and separation from God and all these things. And I, fam, listen, I say hear me out because this is absolutely the best gift that you could ever receive on Christmas is to know that there is consequence for our sin, but that it was fully absorbed in Jesus Christ. Abs- like 100%. Like, do you understand that if a drop, a single drop, of God's wrath was left unfulfilled in Christ Jesus. That would be enough to, in a moment, you are disintegrated. Jesus took the cup. Bottoms up, y'all. He bottomed up for us. That's how big his love is. Christ was wrapped, fully engulfed in the Father's wrath. He took it all on, every bit of it, and he did it for us. That's one of the best gifts we could ever receive. That's one of the things I want you to wake up tomorrow and be grateful for when you're with your kids or whoever. Just thank you, God, that you, that you wrapped Jesus in my wrath, that, that you wrapped him in your wrath, the wrath that I deserve. Father, thank you that you, were, that you were so mindful, that you were so patient, that you were so loving and kind to do to Jesus what I deserved. And thank you, Jesus, for being willing to take it all on. Man, because if you left it for me, if you left it for me, I'll be destroyed. I'm, I'm, I can't handle it. I just can't handle it on my own. And so the last thing that Jesus was wrapped in, Christ was wrapped in victory and vindication. Christ was wrapped in victory and vindication. Let's look at this verse right here in Luke, Luke, Luke 24, I'm sorry. In Luke 24, it says, as they were saying these things, he himself stood in their midst. He said to them, peace to you, peace, peace. That's what they say you want to block, right? Peace, God, peace, peace, peace. <laughs> but they were startled and terrified. And thought that they were seeing a ghost. And he said, why are you troubled? Why are you troubled? He asked them, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look, look at my hands. And look at my feet. That it is myself. Touch me. Touch me and see. Because a ghost does not have flesh and bones. As you can see that I have. Hebrews 12 Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yo, that's good news. That's good news. So what we see in Luke 24, we see Jesus in bodily resurrected form, right? Some people say that Jesus didn't really ascend from the grave. Some people say that he didn't. And so there was these myths and these stories going around that, oh, yeah, he's going to try to come back. And, you know, he ain't really died in the first place. That's why the Roman soldier who was at the, the tomb, when Jesus died, like when Jesus wasn't there, he was like, oh, I'm jumping off a cliff because I know they're going to think that I was a part of this, this plan to just free Jesus and let him just walk out. And so he's like, I'm about, to, I'm about to get up out of here. Jesus actually did get up from the grave, y'all. He actually did. He walked there and he says, it's not a ghost. I am not a ghost. Boo. <laughs> I'm not a ghost. <laughs> Don't let it have been me. <laughs> Don't let it have been me. Oh, man, I would have messed with it a little bit first. But I'm not a ghost. Touch my hands. Look at my feet. See that it's me. Touch me and see that it's me. Jesus was resurrected in bodily form. What does that mean for us? Y'all, it means that Jesus took on our sin, right? I said he became flesh, right? He got wrapped in flesh. Jesus took on our sin. He became flesh, took on our sin, put it on, right? Like a cowboy's jersey, just took all of it right on, right? He went down into the grave. He died. He was dead, y'all. He was dead, but he got up again. Y'all missed it. (laughs) Christ Jesus got down in the grave and got up from the grave. Scripture says, uh, for all have sinned. What'd you say, Chuck? When I think I got it all together, hit up Romans 3. All have fallen short of God's glory, right? Every single one of us. Romans 6 says, for the wages of sin is death, right? So when we commit sin, we deserve death. That's why we die, right? We die because that is the weight of our sin. So if Jesus took on, and, and people don't get up when they die, you know that, right? You, you stay down. <laughs> like, Big Mama is still down. You, she's not back up, right? If she get up, we're having an issue, right? But Jesus, he took on flesh. 
<laughs> he took on flesh. He went down into the grave. When he gets up, it signifies that he did just what I said, just what I read that he was going to do in Hebrews 2, where he destroyed the devil's plan to have death rule over us. When Jesus got out of the grave, it signified that death could not hold us down any longer because he took on all of our sin. So though the wages of sin is death, y'all, the free gift of God is life in Christ Jesus. And so that's where the celebration comes. We don't have to worry about staying down in the grave because Jesus got up, y'all. When he gets up, what that means for us is that we don't have to live our lives in fear any longer. We don't have to worry about the big bad wolf who's always throwing this threat of death. Well, you know I got death. Y'all know that abusive ex or manipulative person who was like, you know how I'll leave you if you do this. You're going to be broken. You ain't going to have nothing. You're going to do all this stuff. Christ Jesus said, get up and be free. What they're saying no longer has the power to hold you down because I am with you. What I've done counts for you. Christ Jesus sets us free. Christ Jesus was victorious over the grave. And because Christ Jesus had victory over the grave, every single one of us who places our trust in him has victory over the grave as well. Y'all, we're going to die one day, but we're going to get back up one day as well, just like Jesus did. And that's where the glory is. That's where the joy is. That's where our excitement lives and exists because Christ did for us what we could have never done for ourselves, y'all. Not in a million years could we have ever, ever dreamed of being able to go into the grave and get back up again. It just don't happen. That's why it was such a big deal. That's why it is such a big deal. That's why it will always be such a big deal for Jesus to be exactly who he said he is. He said, y'all, listen, in three days, I'm going to tear this thing down and I'm going to build it back up again. And they're like, what you talking about? It took us a long time to build this house. He says, you'll see. You'll see. And you know what he did? He went down into the grave and he stayed there for the first day. And then he stayed there for the second day. But you know what happened on the third day? He got up with all power in his hands, y'all. Every single ounce of power belongs to the Father. And he got up with it in his hands. And I promise you, family, if you're in Christ Jesus, that same thing counts for you. It's not your good works. It's not your good deeds that I'll give you that strength to be able to get up. It is just the power of Jesus Christ. It is just the sacrifice that he made being counted for you, being counted for me, y'all. It's nothing that we could do to deserve that. That's what you call a gift. Christ was wrapped in victory and vindication. He stood there keeping his eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. Right? I talked about why would Jesus put on shame? Why would he put on our wrath? Why would he put on flesh even to come into the world? Well, for the joy that was set before him. What's the joy? The joy is seeing us, all of those who would come to know the Lord, being able to be forgiven of their sins and know the fullness of life because of him. So even though what he was going to experience was shameful, even though what he experienced was going to be painful, even though it was going to be emotionally just taxing, he, enjoyed, he endured it with joy because of what was going to come from it, y'all. And that was us. And that's why we say, thank you, Jesus. That's why we're able to stand up and say, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. It's over. It's over for Satan and his plans to try to throw us, to try to throw us off balance because Christ Jesus did the unthinkable for us, y'all. He did the unthinkable. So this season, y'all, if, uh, if you are fortunate enough to unwrap a gift, you're going to wake up tomorrow. Some of y'all going to get up early. Some of y'all going to be woken up by your kids, grabbing your nose and putting stuff in there. Some people going to be woken up by the smell of bacon cooking or, you know, maybe some uh, temptation, silent night. Now, now that's what you play? You play that? Yeah, definitely, right? <laughs> that's in my mind, right? That's, some of us going to be woken up on different, for different reasons. But the reality is, like, when you wake up, before you unwrap a gift, I want you to be thinking about how intentionally Christ Jesus was wrapped for you, right? Jesus was meticulously wrapped. Like I said, not, no, no pine cones and cinnamon sticks, but, but close, <laughs> close, right? Like, he was wrapped even more special than that. Intentionality was put into every single fold, right? Every piece of tape that was placed was with purpose. Every single stitch of the paper was intentional. All of it was done on purpose, with purpose, for purpose. So as you peel back each layer of paper tomorrow morning, I want you to think about the layers that Christ Jesus put on for you, right? Christ Jesus put on flesh so that he could come 
and stand in your place because there needed to be flesh to pay for flesh, right? Christ Jesus put on wrath so that you don't have to endure the punishment that you deserve because of your sin, right? Not because of his sin, because of your sin. Christ Jesus was wrapped in wrath. And then lastly, y'all, Christ Jesus was wrapped in victory. (laughs) He was wrapped in vindication. They thought he was crazy. Why would you do this? Well, for the joy that was set before me. All that I did had a purpose. And we should be excited about that. I want you to be able to express the joy and excitement that accompanies the expression as y'all say it right now. And as you'll say it tomorrow morning, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. It's over. Satan's plan is thwarted because Christ Jesus has done for us what we could have never done for ourselves. He's done for us what we could have never done for ourselves. Christ Jesus has done for us what in a million years we would have never been able to do by our lonesome. It's just not possible. It's layers to this, is what somebody would say. It's layers to what Christ Jesus has done. This ain't something light. Christ purchased your freedom from death with his life. He paid for it. It wasn't cheap. It was expensive, y'all. Birkin, Gucci, Louis. I mean, what's your thing? What's your thing? It, it costs a lot. It costs a lot. And he paid for it in full. Right? Christ Jesus on the cross, and he said, to tell us that it is finished. In essence, Christ said, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. And what he desires, or what Christ requires from us, is just honest appreciation. He's not looking for you to pay him back. He's not sending you a Zelle request or a cash app request. Christ Jesus is saying, appreciate me. Appreciate what I've done. And, and there's a few ways. I'll share a few ways, and then we, we'll be done. A few ways that you can be wrapped up in appre- appreciation this Christmas and every Christmas. First thing we could do, just be humble. Be humble and grateful. Appreciate the work that Christ Jesus has done. Be thankful that he's done for us. Literally, y'all, literally. I I call it the unthinkable. There's no way that we would have been able to come up with this. There's no way that it would be able to happen. We need to be uh, emulating humility and and being grateful for this precious gift of salvation. Uh, We should be praying prayers of thanksgiving, right? Let that be your constant prayer over and over and over continually. Throughout the day, I said, told you before, like when, when I drive or whatever, like I'm just thanking God for the things that could happen that did not happen, right? Like be thankful. Pray prayers of thanksgiving. If you can, journal. Journal. Write down your thoughts of gratitude to keep for yourself for later or maybe even to share with someone else. It's super encouraging to find notes that you wrote out some years ago and see how the Lord was working then and what he's doing now. So that's something that could really help you. But just practice humility. In practicing gratitude, it helps us appreciate Christ's sacrifice, y'all. And what it does is it fosters in us a deeper connection with him. So be humble, y'all, and be grateful. Next thing you do is reconcile and reflect on redemption. That's a hard one. But y'all, Christ Jesus made us reconciled to God. And because he did that, I encourage you, put away all the pettiness. Like, do it this, this, this day, like today. Like even when you leave here, once you text somebody who you know you got beef with, and just tell them, like, listen, this is going on too long. Like, can we be all right? Can we, can we, can we be all right? Can things be okay? Now, for some of you, you've tried that already. And if you tried it, you've done your part, sincerely. If you've done it sincerely, you've done your part. But some of us, we're harboring stuff. We're still holding on stuff that we don't even want. Like, I don't want to talk to you. I don't really want nothing to do with you. I don't like you. And just, I'm okay with not liking you. No. Listen, like I said, we was at beef with God. He, he ain't like us, and we ain't like him. That's true. That's what the scriptures say. I know that's not like a, you know, it's like, oh, what you mean he ain't like me? <laughs> he ain't like, you ain't like him either. But God did for us what we could have never done, right? He initiated reconciliation. He did it. So I encourage you, reconcile and then reflect on redemption. Reflect on the fact that the Lord Jesus took on all of the wrath that you deserve. And because of that, y'all, you are redeemed. Absolutely redeemed. The last thing that you can do is live with hope and confidence in Christ. Hope and confidence. So reflect on being wrapped in vindication because Jesus was. <laughs> being wrapped in victory because Jesus was. Right? The fact that we have triumphed over death. It doesn't matter whatever Satan whispers to you. Whatever the little things are that Satan likes to try to point out about your flaws and your character and all that stuff, I got victory in Jesus. Right? Today is another day. It's another opportunity for me to live righteous. Am I going to do it perfectly? Nope. Like, it's, it's impossible. We're not going to be perfect at it. But every day, 
And every moment, we have another opportunity to give it a shot. And so that's the encouragement. Give it a shot, y'all. Moment by moment. Tomorrow, you're going to wake up. By God's grace. And you will have another opportunity to on his day that we have marked as the birth of his, of, of his, of his birth. I'm sorry, the day of his birth. Uh, we'll be able to actually give him his on his day by remembering these things. I encourage you to do these things today, but especially tomorrow. Encourage your families in the same way. Because, because of Christ Jesus, all that we feared, all that we experienced, all that we're afraid of, no longer is an issue. We are not prisoners of Satan's plots against us. In Christ Jesus, y'all, we will legitimately be able to exclaim, it's a rat. Every time Satan whispers something, like, you know you just a little nasty, you're just dirty, and a little nasty. It's a rat. Now you know you should have wrote an extra zero when you gave them that gift. It's a wrap. <laughs> it's a wrap. Whatever the whispering is, we'll be able to say with boldness, seriously, that it's a wrap. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We are free and free indeed. Father, we thank you so much that you gave us your son, that he came from heaven to earth to show us the way, that he made it possible for us to know what it's like to be vindicated vindicated fully faithfully and finally lord we thank you so much for jesus we thank you what he's done for us we thank you what he promises to do continually in our lives as we work this thing out our salvation with fear and trembling and lord we pray that we be a people who show appreciation sincerely from our hearts lord help us to honor you help us to love jesus sincerely and help us to live for him every day of our lives would you be glorified in jesus name we pray amen Amen.